Comey memo. The White House denies a report alleging President Trump asked then-FBI Director James Comey to drop an investigation into former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Manning released. The soldier convicted of leaking classified government material to WikiLeaks is now out of prison despite a 35-year sentence. Vatican meeting, our nightly report from Rome, and a look ahead to the Holy Father's meeting with President Trump. And a priest's healing touch. A nun recalls a special visit by Father Solanus Casey, who's about to be one step closer to sainthood. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, May 17, 2017. Thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. The White House is denying reports President Donald Trump personally appealed to former FBI Director James Comey to abandon the Bureau's investigation into former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. The president is facing major fallout, but some Republicans want to see the alleged memo before rushing to judgment. President Trump, facing fierce criticism on all sides, left the White House this morning for the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. He had some advice for the new graduates and a message for his critics. Never, ever, ever give up. Things will work out just fine. Look at the way I've been treated lately. The latest firestorm centers on an alleged memo written by the FBI director in February. In it, James Comey says that the president asked him to shut down the FBI probe into Mike Flynn and his Russian contacts. That, according to an unnamed person, who read the memo. Some Republicans, including House Oversight Committee Chairman Jason Chaffetz, are calling into question the existence of Comey's note. And the White House is pointing Changes to testimony from FBI decisions. leadership just last uh, week. So there has been no effort to impede our investigation to date. Quite simply put, sir, you cannot stop the men and women of the FBI from doing the right thing. But the president is still under a cloud after allegedly sharing classified information last week with Russian diplomats. Today, Russian President Vladimir Putin offered to turn over to Congress transcripts of Trump's discussions. No American media were present. Critics also say President Trump risked relationships with allies worldwide by divulging shared intelligence. The Prime Minister of Australia, for one, says those worries are unfounded. That the relationship between Australia and the United States in terms of intelligence sharing is as close as it possibly could be. And Israel, allegedly the source of the highly classified information, is calling its security relationship with the U.S. deep, meaningful and unprecedented. The Israeli defense minister saying that is how it has been and that is how it will continue to be. On Capitol Hill, the top Republican and Democrat senators of the Judiciary Committee demand the FBI hand over that alleged Comey memo. They're also asking the White House to give them any recordings that may exist. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi brings us that story tonight. Jason. Why, it's Senator John McCain says the developments have reached a Watergate size, but Republicans don't appear ready to abandon the president who's key to enacting their legislative goals. And Speaker Paul Ryan says he still has confidence in President Trump. Speaker Paul Ryan warns about the swirling speculation. We need the facts. It is obvious there, there are some people out there who want to harm the president, but we have an obligation to carry out our oversight regardless of which party is in the White House. And that means before rushing to judgment, we get all the pertinent information. Every House Democrat and two Republicans are trying to force a vote to set up an independent commission to investigate Russian meddling into the 2016 presidential election. Of course, Speaker Ryan has shown he has zero, zero, zero appetite for any investigation of President Trump. If passed, the Republican and Democratic leaders of the House and Senate would each pick three non-lawmakers to sit on the commission. But some rank-and-file Republicans continue to defend the president today. Well, I think that that's the, the, the left-wing uh, plan, is to try to distract every way they can, because to deal with the substance uh, of some of the challenging issues that we have today is not in their best interest. House Republican leaders say the latest controversy won't distract them from their work. So Thanks. everything hasn't slowed down the GOP agenda so no. far? The no, certainly, certainly not on the tax reform area. Um, if anything, it's continuing to grow momentum, especially with the White House committing to work with the House and Senate toward a unified plan. 
Republicans cannot escape the Comey controversy. Tomorrow, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein will speak to all senators. His memo was originally cited by the White House as the reason for the Comey firing. The Republican chairman of the House Oversight Committee is asking the former FBI director to testify on this topic at a hearing next week and why at the Senate Intelligence Committee has done the same. Well, Jason, what else have lawmakers said about the latest controversy? Michigan Republican and Trump critic Justin Amash says if the Comey memo is true, it would be grounds for impeachment. Okay, correspondent Jason Calvey reporting from Capitol Hill. Thanks for that report, Jason. And joining us now in studio is Bob Cusack, editor-in-chief for The Hill. Bob, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Thanks for being with us. Uh, some Republicans are mentioning in impeachment, one, at least one Republican. Um, but Speaker Paul Ryan is urging caution. Mm -hmm. How big of a thing is impeachment? Do you think how realistic or plausible is that reality? Well, I think it's real because a lot of independent pundits are talking about it, that if this is, if the memo does exist and this is what happened. Now, of course, the White House has pushed back on this, but they have been relatively quiet other than saying that, that the story from the New York Times was wrong, it could be obstruction of justice. And that's why more and more Democrats, and as you mentioned, uh, one or two Republicans saying, well, we need to find out what's going on, but it could be grounds for impeachment if this is true. That's a big if we need to, as, as Paul Ryan, I think, is safe, uh, safe ground saying, let's find out the facts and go from there. Well, noting all of the controversy uh, swirling around this, where does this leave the GOP agenda? Because they mentioned in Jason's piece about tax reform, but there's right. a lot of other important things. Uh, Obamacare, yep. when it comes to you know immigration, how does this affect those other major issues? Well, it's a big distraction. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the, the president and House Republicans had a big win recently when they finally got the health care bill through the House. But we're not really talking about policy. And, and these are things that Republicans, you talk to them privately, Mm -hmm. They're very exasperated uh, with this White House, and they want Mitch McConnell, the majority leader in the Senate, he wants Trump on message. Stop tweeting. Let's talk about the agenda. So I do think that Republicans are going to try to move their agenda, but this is a big distraction. At this point, does President Trump have friends or allies in Washington that can really help to move his agenda forward? I mean, that's why Republicans, I mean, they have had their differences on Capitol Hill with Trump on the campaign trail and as president. But they have a friend in the White House who's going to sign bills that they want to become law. But if that, that doesn't happen, then I'm going to see more Republicans start to break away from Trump. So what do you think about the media's role in all of this? First off, President Trump says there's a media bias against him. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. How bad of a media bias do you think, if there is one, is there against the Yeah, listen, I think that a lot of the media doesn't like Trump. That is, that is clear. Most political journalists are Democrats. Does that mean they're all biased? No. But is there some type of bias against Trump? Yes. But a lot of these wounds are self-inflicted uh, and that he needs to focus on policy. If he focuses on policy, uh, Neil Gorsuch getting him on the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. that was a good nomination for conservatives, and everybody was unified. He has to unify his party, and right now they are not. Well, from a media perspective here, both of the bombshells, at least in terms of this controversy, are based on anonymous sources. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's legitimate to publish stories based on unnamed individuals? I do. I think that the biggest political stories, whether it's Watergate, Monica Lewinsky scandal, uh, are from anonymous sources. Do I think there's too many, too much use of anonymous sources? Yes, but anonymous sources are key in getting to the truth. But you have to figure out, when you're talking to a source, and you know this, is that you got to think, what's their motivation? It, is that is that pure? And that's mm -hmm. what journalists, that's the role of the media. And sometimes we, we do a pretty good job and sometimes we don't. And still a lot of questions left unanswered about this particular alleged memo. Bob Cusack, editor-in-chief for The Hill, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. Chelsea Manning, the soldier convicted of giving classified government materials to WikiLeaks, is released from prison. Manning served seven years out of a 35-year sentence after being convicted on 20 counts in 2013. In his final days in office, President Obama granted the transgender soldier clemency that drew strong criticism from members of Congress and the military. House Speaker Paul Ryan called the move outrageous. Critics say the leaks revealed some of the nation's most sensitive secrets. The state of Georgia carries out its first execution of the year. J.W. Ledford was convicted of the murder of his 73-year-old neighbor back in 1992. Lawyers asked the parole board to spare him, citing a rough childhood, substance abuse, and his intellectual disability, but the board declined to grant clemency. Georgia executed nine inmates last year, which is more than any other state, and the most the state has executed in a single year since the U.S. Supreme Court allowed the death penalty to resume 40 years ago. A health scare for North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis, the Republican, collapsed during a race today in D.C. 
Tillis took to Twitter to say he's fine and is looking forward to getting back to work. He says he got overheated about two and a half miles into the race. Reports said he needed CPR, but the senator said that isn't true. Severe storms moved through the Midwest. At least two people were killed as the system traveled from Texas to the Great Lakes. Dozens more were hurt. A tornado hit Oklahoma yesterday evening, flattening much of a subdivision 100 miles west of Oklahoma City. Meteorologists say at least eight suspected twisters touched down. Riot police in Greece fired tear gas at a group of protesters as rallies turned violent. Marchers are striking against spending cuts being debated in Parliament. Lawmakers are considering additional pension cuts in 2019 and higher income taxes in 2020. The head of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace will speak at the United Nations in Geneva tomorrow. Cardinal Peter Turkson will address sustainable development goals. It may be a tough sell with other countries, but the Vatican official says everyone needs to work for the common good. They were put in power, given a mandate to work for the common good of the population that put them in power. So if governments have been true to their nature, elected by a people, then they should be working for the common good of the people that entrusted, you know, that gave them the mandate to exercise, uh, you know, power and rule on his behalf. Cardinal Turkson is the keynote speaker at tomorrow's conference. We thank Catholic News Agency's United Nations correspondent in Geneva, Christian Peshkin, for that interview. Pope Francis focuses on Mary Magdalene as a model of Christian hope today. A ognuno di, do, di noi Dio chiama per il proprio nome. The Holy Father reminded tourists and pilgrims at his weekly audience she was the first to see Jesus after his resurrection. Pope Francis praises Mary Magdalene's fidelity after she discovered what he calls the most shocking event in human history, Jesus' resurrection. We're just one week away from President Trump's first face-to-face -face meeting with Pope Francis. They're scheduled to meet May 24th at the Vatican as part of Trump's first overseas trip as president. Joining us now with more on the upcoming meeting is Alan Holdren, the Rome Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. Alan, Pope Francis says he wants to find common ground with President Trump. What issues might be on their agenda? Well, why uh, we expect them to speak of the issues that uh, unite more than uh, anything that may be perceived as negative. Uh, issues such as uh, collaboration for world peace, uh, religious liberty issues, um, issues uh, that, uh, that affect people on the world stage like human trafficking. Uh, points where the Holy See and the United States can work very closely together. We expect uh, this meeting to last about an hour. Uh, speaking with Vatican insiders today, uh, they said they expect this to be a very positive meeting between Donald Trump and P Pope Francis. Well, the Pope has so many responsibilities serving as the Bishop of Rome. What else is on his upcoming calendar? Well, Wyatt, this Sunday he's going to be visiting a local parish here in Rome. It's his fourth visit to a Roman parish this year. Uh, when he goes on these parish visits, he hears confession. Uh, there of the local lay people. He also uh, is going to be greeting parents of the newly baptized children in that parish from the last year. Uh, he'll also be meeting with volunteers from the church. It really is uh, one of these beautiful pastoral visits that the Pope makes uh, that we see so often on his international trips, uh, and he makes them very often here in Rome. Alan, you're also following this weekend's March for Life, which is in Rome. We know about it here in the United States, but how has the event over there evolved over the years? Well, it's only been going on for seven years, Wyatt. This, is, uh, this brings all of the Italian pro-life activists together for one big march here in the capital of Italy. Uh, but it's not just that. It's the, the capital of the Catholic Church. This is the, the center, our center. Um, so it really is symbolic to see uh, all of the Italians who are there, but also all of the religious brothers and sisters, priests, lay people who work and study here in the Eternal City. Uh, they all come together, and it really is a joyful event. Um, we've had as many as 40,000 people all to come together for this, but they're, they're looking to grow it all the way up to 100,000, uh, looking to inspiration from the March for Life there in Washington, D.C. Right? Well, I'm sure it will be inspiring. It's nice to hear about how it has grown over the last seven years. Alan Holder and Catholic News Agency, thanks so much for talking with us about it, Alan. Thank you, White. Coming up, military commencement. President Trump honors the newest Coast Guard graduates. And you're a part of a very, very proud nation. And lawmakers from around the world join the push to combat religious persecution. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. 
President Trump addresses graduates of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. Cadets, you deserve not only the congratulations, but the gratitude of each and every American. And we all salute you. A proud nation. President Trump says the graduates will help secure U.S. borders, pursue terrorists, and keep out those who would do harm to our country. The president made no mention of the James Comey controversy in the speech, but did say no other politician has been treated more unfairly by the media. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito tells graduates at a Catholic seminary near Philadelphia freedom of religion and speech are under threat in the U.S. Justice Alito made the remarks at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary today. He warns of what he sees as an impulse to ban speech some people find offensive. He says religious liberty is being tested. Alito urged grads to keep the flame of those freedoms in the hearts of our fellow Americans. The U.N. expert on religious freedom says Albania is a model of interfaith harmony. The Muslim-majority country also includes Orthodox and Catholic communities. Joining us now in studio is Baroness Elizabeth Barrage, a member of Britain's House of Lords and member of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Baroness Barrage, welcome. You Thank have you. spent the day on Capitol Hill. Tell us yes. why you are here and what you hope to accomplish. Yes, uh, when the Pope visited America back in September 2015, he said it was imperative that people of different religions work together to speak up for the dignity and respect of others. So as legislators, that's what the International Panel of Parliamentarians is trying to do, to stand up for freedom of religion or belief uh, by equipping parliamentarians in different countries. So I went to visit uh, uh, Representative Chris Smith on the Hill today to speak to him about being involved in this network that can speak up in a more collaborative way and help colleagues in countries where their freedom of religion or belief is under threat and often, often under threat with their life being on the line. So we want to work together. And I had a really good reception from people today and we also met the uh, co-chairs of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. So we're hoping to work together as a group. So lawmakers, American lawmakers, U.S. congressmen can join this organization? You're yeah, it's a network. So mm -hmm. when we write letters to heads of state or people wanting, for instance, uh, particular pastors in Sudan who might be in prison or the Turkish pastors who was raised with uh, the President Trump yesterday when he met Erdogan, uh, the American pastor who's in prison. So we would work collectively just uh, writing this, uh, similar letters, but at similar times to try and maximize the pressure that we as a network of legislators can put on. So it sounds like you're getting a pretty positive response by those who you talk with today. What kind of response do you get from international lawmakers? Yes, I mean, we, we get quite a good response uh, in some countries, and we are trying to spread the network. We've had a really good response, for instance, in the Asian, uh, in the ASEAN region, and that's an important place for us to work, but also always to base our work in the regional context. So we're really trying to capacity build parliamentarians in their local context to deal with the problems that are on their own doorstep. The United Kingdom grants asylum to victims of religious persecution, but you said you'd like it to be more inclusive. Uh, how, how does that happen? How, how can it be more inclusive? Uh, the UK parliamentary group that I, I work with has been doing two things. Number one is to try and ensure that our Home Office, who process these claims, have staff who are sufficiently religiously literate in order to assess whether someone is making up that they have, for instance, converted to Christianity and need asylum, and also, though, that the genuine claims are accepted. The second point we've been raising, though, is that under the last parliament, we had a Syrian Vulnerable People's Resettlement Scheme. But unfortunately, we had no comparison for the Iraqis. So the religious minorities in Iraq, which include many Christians and the Yazidis, meant that they were not part of a scheme where, from the region, they could be granted asylum and come to the UK. Aside from all of the red tape, how welcoming in general is the British public to these victims? When there is a human face to victims, people are incredibly welcoming. And one of the main uh, institutions that ensures that they are welcomed is, of course, the church. Uh, but we do have to deal with the political di dynamics that do affect people's views when they're sort of looking at just statistics mm -hmm. rather than a human face. But the UK has a long history of being, of being welcoming to people who are fleeing persecution. Absolutely. Baroness Elizabeth Barrage, a member of Britain's House of Lords, thanks so much for joining us. A pleasure. Thank you. Up next, Pope Francis raises doubts about Mechagoria, what a new Vatican report says about the alleged ongoing apparitions. And Gift of Healing, the story of an American priest's special touch long before he was considered for sainthood. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. 
Pope Francis says he has doubts about the ongoing apparitions of Our Lady reported at Medjugorje, a shrine in southern Bosnia. The Vatican has been investigating the alleged visions since 2010. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, an EWTN senior contributor, joins us now with more on this. Matthew, give us some background here in terms of this investigation. Well, of course, Medjugorje has been a controversial topic for a very long time, really from the 1981 first claims of apparitions. The Holy See has been very concerned. And in 2010, Pope Benedict XVI established a commission on the part of the Holy See, headed by a very trusted cardinal name of Camillo Ruini. That report took four years of study and was eventually handed to Pope Francis. We've seen since then a lot of back and forth in the Vatican about what exactly the Vatican is going to do about the validity of the claims. And that is the very topic that Pope Francis discussed on his in-flight press conference back from Fatima. Pope Francis had an interesting quote in that where yeah. he told reporters that Mary is not the Madonna of the telegraph office, delivering right. a message uh, every day at the same time. What, what are the Pope's concerns about this? Yeah, his concerns are threefold. Uh, first, that the commission itself is very solid, the report that he was given. And it states in that report, according to Pope Francis, that the, those initial 1981 apparitions, the, the commission itself believes, are probably valid. It's the ones after uh, that Pope Francis is referring to here mm -hmm. and that he has expressed in his own opinion, uh, the quote that you just had, that there are grave doubts to be raised. Similar doubts were raised by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith on that very issue in its back and forth with the Commission itself. And then, of course, as Pope Francis always does, he's focused very intently on the pastoral side. And, and that, I think, is one of the keys to understanding what's going on here. Well, maybe we can jump a little bit off the back end of that because the Pope seems very concerned about the outcome of the investigation. Yeah. So noting that, what do you think are his priorities? Yeah, his priorities are to continue studying the validity of those 1981 apparitions, to try to settle on what the Commission and the CDF, or Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, want to do about the subsequent claims of messages and apparitions, but then to focus intently on the pastoral problems that are there. But Francis readily acknowledged in his press conferences, the, the good, the spiritual fruits that seem to have given mm -hmm. birth in Medjugorje, which is why he appointed uh, Cardinal Archbishop Henrik Hozier, a Polish archbishop, to investigate the pastoral situation and to report back to him. Pastoral care for Francis is always the thing, and he does acknowledge that the good and the, the really the conversions and changes of heart that have taken place as a result of people who go there seems so in-depth in terms of this investigation. Where do they go next? What, what can we expect? Yeah, uh, the Pope is awaiting a report from Archbishop Hozier sometime over the summer. Mm -hmm. At that point, I think we're going to see some sort of a definitive statement coming from the Holy See. What I expect is Pope Francis trying to find that middle ground again, of recognizing the real spiritual fruits that have come from Medjugorje, and, and trying to find a consensus in the Vatican for moving forward. It is incredible how, m how much detail the, the Vatican puts into this investigation and how seriously they take it. Yes, this is one of the keys and, and vital roles of the Holy See in this, in determining the validity of apparitions, especially when people's souls are at stake here and the spiritual destinies of the men and women who go there in good faith. Absolutely. We will continue to follow this. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, EWTN senior contributor, thanks so much. Good to be with you. Finally tonight, our partners at the National Catholic Register tell us the story of a miraculous cure thanks to the touch of Father Solanus Casey. Peggy Roney developed a serious infection in a bone behind her ear in the 1930s. Father Solanus Casey visited the Roney family Detroit area home where he prayed and touched Peggy's ear. She ended up recovering to the amazement of doctors. Father Solanus is known for his healing power and it was announced earlier this month he'll be beatified later this year. That's one step away from being declared a saint. To read more about the healing, go on and for the life of Father Solanus, just visit ncregister.com. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll see you back here again tomorrow. Good night and God bless.